Hello and welcome to MoveTube. We are here in Berlin. For yes. the Berlin Ali. <laughs> for the Berlin Ali from Pussy. Um, um, which is secondary to Cannes, uh, or maybe tertiary to Cannes and Venice in Venice. terms of global film festivals mm. for international uh, releases. Um, and with a sterling uh, retrospective program. Yes, they, yeah. they also do a retrospective yeah. program. Um, they have Forum, Forum Expanded, Panorama, uh, and Official Competition. Yeah. Uh, so varying degrees of off the beaten track and the beaten track covered, um, as, as you'd expect. from. Uh, um, boy, uh, have uh, we uh, been festival. beating our tracks. We have indeed. Um, um, let us start uh, on that kind of jocular uh, macho note with Manodrome yeah. by uh, John Satter. So who? Sorry, Sorry John Trengrove. Trengrove. John Trengrove. Trengrove. I'm Trengrove. getting two different names. Two so I'm, I'm adult and and I got to say a little bit hungover and wet. Uh, um, sodden. So. Yes, we just got rained on. Weather in Berlin not very nice. <laughs> just to set the scene. <laughs> the first review is the uh, ambience. First review is the weather. <laughs> you don't get this from Peter Bradshaw. <laughs> Neil Poir. It's a bit um, grim. Yeah, um, grim. But we are we are kicking off this bumper review episode uh, with a review of Manodrome. So this is John Trengrove. This film stars Jesse Eisenberg uh, as Ralphie, uh, a, a, a young guy. That's uh, your name. That's my name as well. Um, a young guy who is having masculinity, his masculinity confronted. Uh, he goes to the gym a lot. Uh, he's trying to bark up. He has a, 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 a wife or a girlfriend who's um, heavily, well, a girlfriend who's girlfriend. Very heavily, yeah. heavily pregnant. Um, and uh, she and he's drifting further apart from him, and further towards a kind of uh, a kind of culture of of, of young men um, who uh, who practice celibacy mm. um, in a kind of cult called the Manodrome, uh, officiated by the high priest Adrian Brody. Indeed. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, what was your first impression of this quite frantic uh, and high octane? Um, We're going high octane. I mean, PC uh, piece. yeah. So I think there's a there's a story tradition of um, you know uh, spinning out and spiraling um, in American cinema. Obviously, we were talking earlier about falling down, um, and I think often these films try to. Uh, Articulate uh, a, a kind of uh, a di dis like a dissonant break with a particular cultural uh, moment. So you know, it's like a, it's the the sublimated roaring forth into the unsublimated. It's an expression of a particular kind of anger with falling down. It's you know, a, a violence or an anger against capitalism and uh, salary jobs and uh, and I guess sort of petty bourgeois suburban mm. values right but this is about really like the the kind of uh elephant in the room is uh, andrew tate it's jordan peterson it's incels it's men's rights activists it's all this did you stuff. did you feel that there as you said about falling down the michael douglas film which mm. has a yeah, stars michael douglas can't remember the director's name but um that yeah that seems to be a reaction against the sort of staleness and the inhumanity of of, of um suburbia and therefore even though we don't condone and mass culture actually and mass culture yeah, yeah. yeah even though we don't condone michael yeah. douglas's violent actions in the film we well, un we feel that it comes from a a place a legitimate place of you, alienation. you sympathize with that with his alienation yeah because his, his frustration is that the breaking point in that film is a a sort of unsympathetic arbitrary rule in a in a in a diner you know he exactly. can't get a breakfast menu because it's past yeah, yeah, yeah. breakfast or oh, well, it's but, but menu, I, yeah. eisenberg's character there doesn't seem necessarily to be a legitimate cultural gre grievance there doesn't seem to be like a tipping point where you know he can't take it anymore it just seems like he himself has an unreasonable kind of is is kind of personally in his identity a bit broken. Well, it and does has an unreasonable expectation of the world to affirm him. It washes. It, in fact, it's an interesting film because it tries to do many things. It tries to highlight the the dangers of this of men's rights activism. I think mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge discourse. Along by the way, um, but it also kind of washes its hands of it, or allows the movement to wash its hands of itself slightly. So uh, Jesse Eisenberg, in becoming affiliated with this cult has a very strained relationship with them. It's, they have this kind of um, ritualistic, uh, physical 
uh, ceremonial therapy session, basically, mm. which is one of the strongest moments in the film, which is a lot of repetitive chanting and affirmations, uh, again, officiated by embroidery. And as it, it appears at Jesse Eisenberg, and they remark on it, is the one who's reacted the most strenuously to this yeah the most tears the most rage the most noise it's it's mm. someone if people have seen the documentary the work mm. that came out about five years ago um which was about a prison therapy yeah. program where where men kind of release their pent their up pent up button down rage yeah um it was a kind of more like a less endorsing version of of that yeah, it was. It wasn't like a, a release. It's Jesse Eisenberg's. The, the anger that's unbottled is is uh, dangerous. Quite ugly. Yeah, Dang dangerous. Ugly. And I, I think there's 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 this this, this valence of the idea that uh, yeah, uh, the movement itself is is at fault. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also says it, it it goes to efforts to show that the men who constitute this cult, for the most part, are quite amiable, um, well-meaning. Uh, ordinary people. It's quite a, a a a rainbow coalition of you know sort of elder, older black men, working class white men, little gay coded guys. You know, it's mm -hmm. like quite a, a a diverse crowd and young, actually young men as well. Um, and they are shown to be relatively harmless, whereas Jesse Eisenberg is shown to be harmful because mm -hmm. he takes it. Uh, he doesn't even really follow its tenets. So the the kind of denouement, the, the third act of the film, is that he. He he pushes against the cult. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a a, a, a kind of uh, well, he gets he gets bummed in a factory. Um, so he has this get just to, just to, to flag this up. This yeah. is a spoiler, but you know he, he has this yeah, sorry, moment. The, the 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 cliche of the angry repressed toxic man who is deep down a bottom, deep down yeah, yeah, yeah. wants to be bummed by another man. Uh, such as his kind of like sense of male supremacy um it the movie goes there decides to go there mm. and then this unleashes a kind of um <coughs> avalanche a kind of um uh, what's violence another another good uh, a litany was a metaphor sort of like one thing leads to another kind of a, a snowball a cascade a snowball of um <laughs> violent acts killings he's on the loose for for an afternoon uh, it deals with that like, in a know. very perfunctory way, actually. It kind of wraps all of this this chase up in the end. So, yeah, he has this 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 homosexual uh, dalliance, um, uh, and he is the bottom in this, uh, which is interesting. So he's he's kind of in his world, in his mind, I suppose, cucked in a way. It's his liberating mm -hmm. moment. It's also kind of uh, a, a, a sort of um, a mas emasculating him in a way. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, he, go, he he has this gun, which is gifted to him by the cult leader. And then there maybe they're in a potted idea that maybe it's not the the people who follow the movement, but the leaders who are responsible for uh, the actions of, of, you know, effectively brainwashing members. Yeah, because he, and, and in a sense, he takes their advice um, too literally. So the, the idea of the cult is that you tell these people, no one's ever valued you in your life. Um and, and and but we do value you yeah, because you are actually you know you are you are actually you have this inner power um and uh and it's weird actually because a lot of cults actually don't really tell people that in a different way where they they're still subordinate to the leader but this guy pillared by andrew brody you know tells ralph um uh, you you know you are there is no god but you mm. uh, and he takes this advice uh literally and becomes a a serial killer. He 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 decides to overrule, uh, with the help of a of a, of a Glock, uh, overrule anyone mm. that comes um, in his way. So, well, yeah, sort of uh, through the barrel of a gun. It's so I, I th yeah I think again like, it's interesting how the film kind of tries to um, tessellate all these uh, different uh, discursive. Um, these dis well different discussions effectively. So you've got you've got kind of got this gun control. NRA vibe in here. You've mm. got the MRA. You've got you've got the M. You know, men's rights activists. You've got the National Rifle Association. You've yeah, got all of these yeah. kind of things, and it, it's kind of allegorical in a way. So this this movement isn't the, the word incel is never used. It's celibacy. They never talk yeah. about voluntary cel celibacy. I think someone kind of vaguely alludes to it. So everything is kind of abstracted from real real political scenarios. It's obviously re referencing actual shootings that have been have happened in the United States that have been linked to, mm. to in incels. Um, there's no obviously no evidence that there is some sort of voluminous cult in a way. Yeah, it's an abstracted kind of yeah. um, amalgamation of various phenomena 
that we have been thinking about in the last 10 years with regards to masculinity. Yeah, so it's like a state of the uh, art. It's like America. a state of the nation address yeah. about these particular, you know, masculinity and now right and, stuff. and the far right. But again, it's like, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a, such a, it's a, a sloppy mess. It's a hot mess in a lot of ways. Like, um, I think there are some interesting, and maybe this will be a, a theme we'll come back to in a way, but, you know, within, uh, say, modern or contemporary art house filmmaking, you know, a sign of an okay film is that you can see the, the outlines of better films within it. Yeah, and I, I could snap off. From exactly. It way, you know. And I think there were moments that were promising. I think there were certain mm. formal qualities uh, and maybe in the case of a, of a Hollywood film or even a Hollywood indie film, this just means that they had a great colorist and a great cinematographer, but like, yeah, it looks good. You know, it, it, it does have a nice um, palette to it uh, and uh, the shots and the editing uh, I was I was pretty I was pretty engrossed by all that stuff. I thought it didn't it didn't linger. I don't mean in a slow cinema way, but it didn't it di clearly didn't linger enough on some of the set pieces it had to hand. It knew know? how to to I think draw out the oppressiveness of these these kind of um, American extra e extra urban spaces in a way. Mm. So there's malls. There's their kind of g gross apartment. There are gyms. You know, dark harshly lit gyms yeah, yeah. Uh, there's neon there are car parking garages there are uh, motorway intersections mm. there are kind of uh, convenience stores that's the, the for the most part that that is the the urban environment which this film yeah and that out. was very uh, well evoked it was it was it was oppressive but i think there's also this great physical uh, element as well so jesse eisenberg for this role really it beefed up in an excellent way in a, in a kind of like slightly almost grotesque it was like a grotesque yeah, yeah. in a way like his his bulking was uneven and it was like it was almost like this this uncoordinated thing his body he wears these kind of poorly fitting clothes he doesn't have like the the glossy muscular beauty of like you know and uh, like pumping iron on a schwarzenegger all the kind of 80s yeah. sex that's associated with and, and the homoeroticism associated with like you know um uh you know bodybuilding yeah, yeah he's yeah. actually quite an ugly He's got, it's an ugly body that he inhabits. In this yeah, film, and know? yet there's this kind of, um, as he did with with Mark Zuckerberg when he played uh, him in the Social Network. Um, you know, there's there is he still he still has that en enigmatic mm. and striking quality as a performer. I mean, I do think in mm. in the context of just I don't like to do act no, to frame things in terms of actors very often, but yeah. in the in the context of the performance art career of Jesse Eisenberg, you know, the, his range is pushed really well in this film. Yeah, I think so. And I admire his performance. I also admire the performance of Odessa Young, who plays the very sympathetic girlfriend. The problem with this film, of course, is that it is telling you what to think, mm. and it is uh, it is creating a a very simple equation. Um, that if, you know, if you, it's almost like it's saying if someone you know starts saying these sorts of things, that means they are going down this road and what happens when you go it's down this road? It's a cautionary tale. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens when you go down this road when you touch this um, circuit board or this pylon uh, mm. is that you, you frazzle to death. You, you, you described you know, it as like a, almost like a, a kind of industrial safety video. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, and that, that is, that, and then you could sort of tell that by the publicity around the film, although I had a very open mind when it, when it started because yeah. there were these kind of qualities of a thriller and I think, you know, this is maybe something that Hollywood has kind of lost touch with is the ability to um, to just rely on 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 the beauty of procedure um, mm. which brings us if we're well, ready, actually, no, no, quite I, well I, I, we're not film, quite but, ready yet because I, I, I think um, there yeah the, 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 in terms of the it, it, you know we, we kind of you know we're going to spoil these films anyway of course so obviously you know if you don't want them spoiled you know turn away but the, at the end, after his kind of shooting rampage he has this this kind of um, Damascene moment where he seeks shelter in an old people's home um, oh, yeah. and he's comforted by this enormous giant of a man who tells him this this very moving story it's about a Middle Eastern guy yeah um, Sasha. Here, and then he, this is like as it were the father figure that he's longing for yeah. and he falls asleep in his lap as the man sings to him and it's very moving but it's again it's a very uh, lumpen uh, finale to the film to try and give some sense of salvation and it, it kind of it, it again it tells you it tells a very it's a very closed loop in a way why um, did why do directors feel the need to create um that sense of closure it's because it's catharsis in a way it's but saying I didn't there's this bad thing these bad people are out yeah. here um wielding enormous uncontrolled power but if um, you just show them a bit of love if you show them a bit of love but it, we all know it's more complicated than showing love you know it's too think. neat because sometimes mm. you, there are some people you show them love and, and then you know that you can never show them enough love 
Mm. Uh, they will always black holes that swallow. Yeah. So, but I mean, uh, even yeah. that, I, I, there's no message I would want to drive for. This is the problem with these films: is that they they um, they they seem sort of insecure about the, the their own truth content, and and so they ram yeah. ram home. Uh, and, and and yeah, and just just lastly on the um on the point about Andrew Tate and John Peterson and all these yeah. sort of manosphere manosphere people, um, I, I think if you were going to make something interesting. Uh, with a lowercase i <laughs> uh, <laughs> about that sort of topic I think it would be interesting to dwell on the fact that you know when you in real life when you meet someone who's into these kind of uh, self-help gurus um, often they they are quite reasonable people mm. who often absorb the less harmful aspects of these these people and and yet there is still this great sense of unease that perhaps you know, perhaps one day they will. The live they will, the they're, 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 The vulnerability that has drawn them to these kinds of uh, uh, d- demagogic figures will is ultimately that um, that they will ultimately open up that vulnerability to someone, you know, very charismatic and very dangerous. Yeah, because I, um, I think but I, I like to keep that uncertainty there mm. and to understand that this is not some kind of extreme alien force that we only see in movies it's actually part of a whole continuum of the human experience yeah. and like the ability the fact that people like like most people in this world don't really know uh, don't really have great self-worth and don't really know what path they should be on you know? not, yeah. not most people I don't know, but, but I think that that's what I mean people. there's there's a lean of film in here which explores uh, therapy and and male self-reliance and, and mutual support in this therapeutic strange mm not even cultish but quasi cultish therapeutic context and i think those the film there that is the mm. film unto itself in a way and it's that and that's again a film of procedure um it's a film of 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 i think duration as well i would like to have seen that element of the film expanded and rounded out rather than having using jesse eisenberg as this kind of allegorical um uh, sort of Canterbury Tales character mm. who moves through these different social stations. There, there were moments when it almost, when it obviously this is going to be a theme of well, this is a theme of MovieTube anyway, but it's going to be a theme of this episode probably. Uh, this all this trip in Berlin. Sorry, I'm just uh, uh, unwrapping right. a, an orange. Go for it, go for it. Um, the citrus, the scent of the citrus will permeate through the the, the sound waves. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the you know there were moments where it felt almost like Jean Dillman or something, where where it had this strange structural quality of. And those were the moments where you were just looking a lot at the main character and observing him in these different situations, uh, and and his, and because his performance was very compelling, it, um, it 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 worked, and and I I just uh, I just regret that it didn't um, put thank you uh, that it didn't sort of push that zone more. Uh, it was a bit like in the way that Leah um, Leah Sadu in France by Bruno Dumont, you know, mm. she you just get to watch her on screen a lot. And therefore, her performance—you know—it makes it an, act, an actor's film, but that's perfectly mm. fine when, when the actor can carry. Well, this, this was a, a, lot, of, a lot of vehicle. action. Yeah, you know, first and foremost, this was a—you know—a sort of role expanding. Um, it was, but yeah, um, unfortunately, it was trying to take on far more than that. Um, I, I, but I mean, let's let's we talking about re- for, uh, let's talk about moreness and muchness, um, and maybe we can move to. Uh, Tina Satter's reality, which we actually saw um, uh, yesterday, so it's it's a little bit in the rearview mirror for us. Now, this is a film based on a a real event, um, in which uh, based on a a a. Sorry, I'm just swallowing some orange. <clears throat> it's based on a real event uh, of an NSA um, uh, leaker, um, so a document a leaker, whistleblower, a whistleblower in, in the in the tr- long tradition of you know Edward Snowden, um, Chelsea Manning, yes. A yeah. more minor figure. I hadn't heard a much of more minor figure. So the context is in 2016, a an NSA contractor or employee uh, leaked um, evidence to the Intercept um, that uh, proved uh, Russian meddling in the in Trump's election, basically. Mm-hmm. So uh, this woman, um, her name was Reality. Reality winner. Lee winner. Reality she was not. Lay winner. It, ultimately, she was not winning at Reality. Not winning. So what yeah, happened? She yeah. was um, a real name, by the way. Not yeah, that's actually surprisingly a real name. Um, she was uh, not wrapped. She was heavily wrapped on the wrist uh, by kind of like uh, sentencing. Made an guidelines. example of five years in the in a, in the slammer for this uh, act. But I think what the film does is it takes what is. Uh, I think it's a, this is a political thriller, but this is where you get a thriller mm-hmm. that speaks to a wider 
uh, discoursey context, perhaps, mm-hmm. but shrink wraps the entire mm-hmm. uh, package down to a very uh, kind of contained, lean whole. And for for me, uh, this has so far in the festival been actually my, I think my favorite film. Mine too. Um, I mean, so w- w- uh, walk me through. You know, this is I wish to mention this is mm-hmm. Sydney Sweeney, um, actually, you know, of uh, Euphoria. Um, and White Lotus fame was playing um, reality. But, you know, tell me, why did this film, um, how does it tessellate with your reality? Well, <laughs> so um, Sydney Sweeney uh, arrives home. She drives to uh, her house, which is in Georgia, in suburban Georgia. Uh, and there are two men uh, waiting for her. Um, it turns out they are working for the FBI. Uh, they are very friendly. Uh, but there is a an, a a kind of unspoken caution and tension that rears its head uh, in moments where she tries to get a bit too close to them. Uh, they want to look at her phone. They have a they have a, they have to announce that they have these warrants to search um, uh, her property and her car and her phone. Um, and uh, but they manage broadly to um, to keep the. Uh, keep the interaction in a f- in a fairly so like sort of uh friendly uh good cop space um in the initial phase of what becomes an interrogation well, the, yeah the, the 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 power dynamic is always present but it it sort of seethes around Absolutely. this 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 veneer of of barely held in check uh, pleasantry and 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 this is this is a, a, a this is a, i guess a, a classic trope of the of the um you know, of any interrogation drama, um, you know, in, in any good TV show, but it it it, it has a, even though it's based on a play, it has a very cinematic build up, it in the way that these these unknowns pass through the cinematic space, and the way that these dramatic ironies or these you know, well they're not really dramatic ironies because we don't really know unless you've read up on the story, we don't really quite know what's going on. We don't know how much she knows mm. about what they're going to tell yeah, her, her and her this innocence. thing unfolds. Yeah. And it mostly takes place in one room. Mm. Um so again, like weirdly would be theatrical. There are certain aspects of the way it's made. Uh so so it starts off, I'll just say it's announced that this is all a transcript from a real recording and I I'm afraid to say uh, judging by films like Manodrome, which we saw at the festival, which we spoke about just now, um, uh, I'm afraid to say taking your screenplay from an actual verbatim <laughs> recording <laughs> seems to be a more viable artistic route for mm-hmm. Hollywood than anything a screenwriter well, seems lends, to be able to come up with. It lends a, 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 it lends a, lends a naturalism. I mean, we're, we're I, there might be di- divergences, but I, I'm led to believe that it's almost a, a, a blow for blow exact. That's what it says on the screen. Yeah. yeah. So the recording was about 90 minutes. And you long. hear little bits of the recording dotted in and out. I thought mm. for a moment it was going to be an experimental project where they were going to mouth along to this horrible recording. It was going to be dubbed over. <laughs> yeah, the top. yeah. I think the yeah. first there was like a one little bit where you see the FBI actors. Um, so mouth along to the actual recording, and then it transitions and into then it transitions diegetic into the acting. Uh, I think because it's, it's it's interesting how uh, it the we know we know the interrogation as a trope of of prestige television of of yeah. of, of, of classic Hollywood noir. Um, I think it's a well worn, a well trodden um, uh, uh, genre. But I think what's really interesting about this, what I really liked about it, was the. The procedural nature of this, we see this this kind of police interrogation unfolding in all its banality. And I think I, I was really afterwards hesitant to use these words, but the, the kind of unfortunate kind of formulation that comes to your lips is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, and banality of evil. Um, Hannah Arendt, uh, so, when yeah, she interviewed Eichmann about Eichmann, the, yeah, yeah, so the Eichmann trial. Um, and I think there is a a, a real, because often we see this, this uh, when we encounter power in the government in Hollywood films, it's often in a kind of uh, soft projection of American power and exceptionalism. So we see the cop side and what we get is, we rarely see the victim side. Um, and we see these kind of Thomas Villeneuve style things where... Uh, sorry, the victim, the... Um the, uh, the, the, the Yeah, the... The, the, the alleged the perpetrator. Alleged perpetrator. So what we see with uh, like this Thomas Villeneuve style uh, kind of spec ops cinema is a, a sleek, fearful, terrifying shock and awe of black cars and uh, suited, you know, kind of uh, camoed up 
uh, anonymous police officers and things like that. Uh, that slickness is washed away here with this kind of drab, incredible drabness. Uh, so it, all these policemen are, are kitted out in these in their Oakleys and their in their chinos, and they've got these disgusting like canvas belts. And mm -hmm. the camera, what often happens is you see these bodies slowly accumulating in this space in a house, interrupting the lens. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of squeezing together inside her small, quite shabby little home. Um, and you get these legs and crotches with these kind of dick prints on them because her trousers are too tight or ill-fitting or they're too fat. These kind of bulky, fat, you know, placid FBI men in uh, shirts that don't really fit. So there's this, there's this bodily... Uh, uh, and you're able to speculate about what these, what these bodies are capable mm. of. Like, you know that they are... Are, they are armed or you know they are ready to they're capable at any moment to to turn on the tap of that exactly and there are these yeah. and there are these there are these certain regulations they have to follow mm. um such as are you, you aware know, they, we're doing this yeah, are you happy yeah. yeah can you confirm blah, blah, blah. and they and they won't they won't let her be in the room with only one officer it has to be two so even though they're being really friendly and asking mm. her these like casual questions in between the less casual questions mm -hmm. they're still having to maintain certain standards uh, of security because they are mm. because they are dealing with this massive thing and we're not quite aware yet what that massive thing is even if you watch it with the full knowledge of the case i think you'll still feel this extraordinary tension and it, it is like a classic almost like a noir it's like a classic hollywood thriller and, it, and it's a procedural and it's it's just um yeah and it, and and apart from a few strange sort of gitchy glimmicks or kind of news clips that sometimes work sometimes don't um, it, it, it's yeah, a it, basically a very restrained exercise compared mm -hmm. with most films. It injects the kind of bits of lip filler um, here and there, you know, about the context of it. It kind of reenacts her at her desk, you know, and she explains how she hid the printed out this email and hid it in a kind of pantyhose. Uh, it shows her kind of doing that at her desk, and it's Americans, eh? Yeah, Americans. Eh? It's like, well, uh, I didn't. We didn't need to snap to that because uh, observing her face and and what the camera does is it's often showing her in this this. Um, it's kind of head and shoulders um, shot. It's quite close, and often mm -hmm. the camera's very, very slowly pushing in, like a kind of mm -hmm. slow, like the the, four, the 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 field of power collapsing, yeah. you know, circling around her and tightening. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to cut to those uh, those uh, elements from the outside, I suppose. So every for that, you know, in that sense, it kind of it's better to keep us in the room with her. Um, yeah. I think that was that was and that was one of my you know critiques maybe, but it's so, it's so it's so minor it does not spoil the broth at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I, I was so awed by the the way in which it, it generated tension exciting. that I that, that that was that was bigger than the slight bristling I had with some yeah. of the the things that make it look a bit like a Vice documentary. But um, mm. yeah, hats off to uh, Tina, Tina Satter, Satter, who is who is. Primarily a stage director, and this was a stage play first. Her stage play, yeah, she and she's trans, not a, an activist filmmaker, as far as I can tell. I mean, she may be sort of somewhat sympathetic with. I mean, you know, it's hard not to be sympathetic with the protagonist, given the you know the right. sort of. But it does um, make uh, the interesting but thing out is it, it makes um, talking about kind of you know responsibility with uh, the the cult and um, Adrian Brody's character in um, manager room. manager room, but it almost makes uh, uh, the intercept out to be uh, predatory. Or irresponsible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. sort of. It, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't balance the books either. But it does sort of allow for you to have some doubt, a nuanced view on this crazy mm. situation that we all lived through about five or six years ago, where Trump had been elected and there was this huge hysteria, which mm. reality winner is caught up in because, of course, James Comey, the FBI director, was um, was was um, dispatched by Trump. Uh, by Trump. Um, we are we are we are taking our time. But I, I think that is, that is so my. I think this film, <coughs> you know, should it distribute widely which uh, you know hopefully it will i think Very it's, likely, it's yeah. absolutely it's, it's it's a thrilling tight 90 minutes it's, and the breakout it's, performance from sydney sweeney it really a huge breakout pro i mean it's, it's also just it's really exciting which is mm -hmm. you know it's it's it, political thriller is uh you know you it, it, it's it's the quality of a gene hackman in the 70s or something it's got this amazing uh tautness to it and this 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 mm. barely contained energy it's it's amazing there were two films i thought of during it um Alan Clark, um, and uh, well, he did an interrogation project uh, called uh, oh God, what was it called Psycho something. Anyway, um, and uh, but he 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 specialised in the procedural. A lot of his films have um, made in Britain, for instance, has an amazing kind of interrogation scene. Um, 
and The Trial by Orson Welles, which is an amazing kind of dream sequence film. Not explicitly, but it, it, it definitely uh, evokes A that. ratcheting of paranoia. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which, uh, which, yeah, which, which I think um, it does that thing that reality um, does so well uh, of, of conjuring into being a feeling uh, through like procedures and actions um, that we can see very clearly. Uh, and then we through that we can feel something else even clearer. Next up, and uh, now for something completely it's different. Completely <laughs> different. <laughs> uh, we are talking about Lu Zhang, uh, a Chinese director, Chinese Korean director, um, whose new film, The Shadowless Tower, we just saw at Berlin. Um, oh, and you've been you've been looking at Lu Zhang's career from Tang Poetry, his debut, to uh, and then. Um, uh, grain in ear. His second, that's his second, his second film. film. I've watched. I've 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 I've, I've zanged quite deeply. I've mm-hmm. zigged and zanged basically. Um, I mean, I think yeah. I'll pre- I think in order to talk about Shadowless Tower, it's important to set the stage a little bit with his early filmmaking. Um, wh- you know, he, he so he's an ethnically ethnically Korean um, filmmaker whose family moved to China. Um, so and th- that that kind of um ethnic minority occupies a very strained place in chinese society in terms of like, integration um i think that what what i love about tang poetry and about grain and ears they're both deeply very restrained films in the kind of tradition of maybe hu shoshan um and early Shishanki. to an extent or maybe even Ulrich Seidel was coming to mind when I was yeah, yeah yeah there's a kind of a uh, plain air uh kind of available light you know, uh, sort of uh, tripod. Uh, yeah, try. You know, straight. You know, very static. Um, and I think what works really well with his early films is is their restraint and their. I suppose that their kind of mannered artificiality um, and the way in his early films he you get intrusions of um, pop music, karaoke music, actual you know Lee Bai like t- actual Tang Dynasty era poetry into these very drab, denuded, uh, often rural or kind of uh, shabby industrial um, spaces. Um, this film, uh, I think in a lot of ways, that, that lean Lu Zhang has given, has, has been on the bloat a bit, and mm-hmm. you know, it's been at the buffet, and I think has kind of bloated to, to attach all these other uh, giggles to itself. So the, the very tight, very lean, very strained and, and very odd Lu Zhang uh, of, of you know, of 20 years ago, um, you know, of, of like 2002, 2003, 2004, uh, he kind of transitions slowly. You know, Could you give us a brief summary of, the, of this film, of what happens? Yeah, so L- Shadowless Tower is basically size? basically set mostly in Beijing. Uh, it, it centers, it gravitates around a, a food writer, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of Jay Rayner, a <laughs> Chinese <laughs> Jay Rayner. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, who and his his kind of photography partner, as it mm-hmm. were, a young kind of manic pixie dream photographer, um, and a younger lady, a, yeah, much much younger lady. And from there, it's it's very hard. It basically explores a series of strands of of longing and absence mm-hmm. and family. Uh, he has a, a a kind of estranged father who abandoned them many many years ago uh, in public shame from the family for allegedly groping a woman on a bus. Um, there is there are lots of uh, he has a an ex-wife a daughter with the ex-wife and his ex-wife is dying of cancer it turns out uh, his best friend from university kills himself during the film so there's lots of these different tangents and it, again i think what works uh it, the, the leanness of a film like grain and ear which is merely about this mother trying to bring up her son mm-hmm. and suffering the injustices of uh uh and privations of poverty uh, in in this kind of uh, 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 um, industrial town, shabby industrial town here, it goes all in with these these multiple different tessellating um, arcs, uh, story arcs basically. One of which would have sufficed, perhaps. So, again, this is one of those films that, for me at least, was okay, but you, and therefore you can see that the the outline of better and mm-hmm. you know or more contained films within. It's a very long, two, it's a very long two and a half hours. <laughs> Um, and it's, I think, the the kind of formal restraint and formal rigor of his early cinema, 
uh, which I, when I wrote my piece about it last week, uh, my Substack, I kind of alluded to being kind of actually in a way Jin Dalman esque, uh, so Achaemenic and and also a bit uh, Godardian mm -hmm. in its effect. Uh, this is kind of so lapsed. About green, about green and grain and ear, grain and ear and tongue yeah. poetry. Yeah, and I think that that those things have lapsed and given way to something that is, I think, much more singing from the hymn sheet of um, contemporary Asian art house. Um, middle brow cinema it's it's got drive drive my car mm -hmm. uh, uh um valences it's got a lot of kind of contemporary park chan wook or it's got elements you know sort of decision to leave mm -hmm. vibes about it uh mm -hmm. it's a much more mobile camera um it's the generally more con uh, conventional compositions m more conventional compositions uh a lot more saccharine i think it kind of goes it tries to play well no no i've, I've been talking about it for ages and I'm, I'm kind of curious because i know you were making notes during this while, while yeah i mean it was it was it was the most boring film of the festival so far for me <laughs> i was absolutely fuming throughout um uh, i was angry because i thought uh so we reviewed after sun a few weeks ago um which is a film which people see, which very rooted in a relationship, in the content of a relationship that's depicted on screen. Mm. And people who like it generally say it reminds them of a holiday they took with their dad. Um, you know, regular listeners of this show will know that we don't think that's a very good reason to like a movie. Um, but uh, but yeah, this film also seemed to be rooted in a, in just kind of trying to like dwell on a relationship. Obviously, I like Roma. I like you know films about intimacy and people, but. Um, yeah, this this felt shapeless. There were loads of, um, you know, like it felt like it could just go on forever. There was no real reason for it to start and end where it did. Um, there was a lot of uh, tell rather than show. Uh, people just rolling up and saying, "Oh, this thing has just happened," um, <laughs> yeah. off screen. Your and, friend's just killed then, himself. Goodbye. Yeah. And then just like leaving us with this, what was what in another director's hands might be a sort of devastating. Uh, a kind of uh, abyss um, around some new devastating, uh, new, some new like dark information, but mm. actually was just kind of like banal. Um, yeah, so I felt like it was just generally indulgent of a, a kind of anxious yearning vibe. Like, I, obviously, there are loads of people who are like this. There are loads of um, men who kind of hanker after unavailable women who uh, hover around uh, hankering men. You know, there are these kind of like irritating sex, you know, like. Dy irritating dynamic, but there's an excess of of longings that interact. Yeah, in and this film, longing is so self-conscious. Mm. I mean, that you know, he, he's he's seen reading the book um, "Lover's Discourse" by Roland Barthes, which that particularly pissed me <laughs> off as a kind of. Uh, I didn't uh, mind that, and I actually loved the printed edition that they showed. No, but, well, that's um, that's, that's, that's extremely neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, I thought it was. I thought it was. Um, it was weirdly heavy-handed and um, and lacking in um, in punctuation. Um, it, it it sort of seemed to to drift structurally. It seemed to drift, mm. uh, and yet it and yet it had these vignettes that were extremely um, ha like hammering the point home. There's a bit towards the end, uh, right at the end, where uh, where um, you know various parallels have been made between him and his father, and then uh, there's a shot of him sat at, at, at a chair, and then the camera goes up into the sky. And then the camera comes down, and it's his father sitting where he was. Mm. Uh, this is the final shot of the film. This is like this while is it's like, snowing. This by is the way. like For a bit yeah, while it's snowing, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is like something you might do to so A-level film studies, like to try and sort of show that you know there, there's a similarity between two characters. It's 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 really that's uh, already really embarrassing. Uh, that's already present. The exactly. Film, the film's already and the film, the film should have faith in its own subtlety um, to to convey that. Um, unfortunately. Yeah, at, at various points. I mean, there, there's you know there are these kind of jokes about. Uh, well, I mean, there was lots of sort of knowing laughter in the audience. And no, there was no real actual kind of jokes. But there were these. There were this bit where where um, uh, he asks a Korean to, to give him any word in Korean, and the guy says "sarang," it means love, um, and then he's <laughs> like, "But in Uyghur, it means fool." And, and yeah, it's, it's very just like knowing. It's so heavy-handed, mm. so twee, and 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 just left a horrible taste in my mouth. And it just looked like shit. I thought the color was rubbish. I thought the compositions were rubbish. I thought it thought it was much better than it was because it doesn't look like a conventional. Hollywood I don't even film. know. It felt but very, it low, very low, low energy. It, it it felt like it was trying trying uh, like a Chinese effort, as it were. And it was very 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 overproduced. This film, in the sense, so I mean that from the production side. So when the film begins, there's almost this kind of parodic film before the film which is watching the, the production company idents and they go <laughs> on and on 
and on. This is a very avant-garde reading. I like it. It is. And I think it's this interesting thing where you realize this, that maybe it's too many cooks spoiled the broth in a way with this film because you can see... You think it was decided by committee? That's quite bold. Uh, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not making that claim. I mean, maybe I will, but I, I think there's a sense of this film trying to basically be, to ride on the kind of middle brow successes of something like Drive My Car. And tonally, the film feels like it's reaching for the same things. You know how Drive My Car ends... Uh, with the visit to the um, the, the girl's um, village, which is in the snow. And this film also ends with a shot in the snow, a meaningful encounter in the snow. I think there's a lot of uh, allusions to... attempt to inject gravitas into something using these, like... By changing the weather, it's... Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's very lazy. I think I'm, I'm kind of reminded of, you know, um, Henry James talking about Tolstoy and 19th century literature, you know, loose, baggy monsters. And I think this is a loose, baggy monster. Um, but, yeah, that being said, there, there is the the... The shat, there's the imprint again, there's a silhouette maybe of the restrained Lu Shang in this film. Um, and often that's with these, these again, these, uh, these uh, sort of um, slightly surreal, exaggerated, um, uh, inauthentic performances, uh, which you get in, uh, say, Grain and Ear and Tang Poetry and Doom and River to an extent. Um, and you have these moments of kind of w weirdness and kind of, but then there's naturalism as well. It, it, it tries to exist at different tonal registers. Um, so, but there's, there's still like, there's still, I found it very charming in some ways. Like I, I like the, I like this, ex the idea of the story of a food writer. I think it's quite interesting. Um, but yeah, it was kind of grasping for profundities that, uh, weren't really earned and I think it was kind of like a pick and mix of various of Ty Taiwanese new wave so you had mm -hmm. this this shot where he goes to this kind of ruined um, with the girl ruined uh, orphanage where she he doesn't he isn't aware mm. a bit dramatic irony but he's not aware that she was an orphan there um, reminded me of the beautiful well, you're about to say it as well yeah I mean the, it kind of the was the boys like of Feng Kui by Feng Hu by Hu amazing Shen. scene in, in a blasted out uh, building. yeah but the boys look out over the city from this this kind of this third or fourth floor of this this abandoned parking lot basically and it's this moment where they, they drink in the immensity of this this city um, kind of a dwarfed and alienated by it it's also a moment of real transcendence uh, and it's from it kind of has one of those but it does that twice you see them the framing of an outside twice and maybe even three times but it's looking out onto some boats and it's not entirely clear it, yeah it's, it's doing the same thing but it showed there was none of the legwork done to earn that moment mm. of profundity in a way um so i think yeah it was a, it was a loose baggy monster it's, it was kind of disappointing in a lot of ways because i was really of all films, I was most excited to see this new Lushan. Oh, really? Because oh. I well, because I've been on such like a Lushan bender mm. at the moment. And I was like, I really, uh, I'm really interested in his method of working, um, but I haven't seen his most recent clust cluster of films, and so I suppose he's kind of. They're probably likely to be quite similar to this. <coughs> I should think so. I don't think this is like a dramatic break, formal break with his. I think it's just been an accumulation. But I think particularly, you know, it's more of an invocation. Like, don't don't take our our Ralph's loathing and my uh, mid feelings about this film um as an invocation against watching Lu Shang but watch watch Grain and Neil watch like Tongue Poetry and watch yeah. early Lu Shang and I was also not as much of a fan of what I saw of Grain and Neil but I would no doubt be uh what you <laughs> ad admonished about? by Owen for not you watching be, the full because thing because the amazing <laughs> so the amazing thing about uh Grain and Neil which I will separate is the end of the, the whole film is shot in this very staid static way um it, it's kind of sublimated anomic feeling of the uh, uh, or Q, the main character um, when she breaks free from this the camera then moves and it mm -hmm. has this over the shoulder tracking shot that lasts about five minutes as she just stumble walks away from the town and into the fields oh, you, did send the, you did send this shot it looked amazing yeah. it's absolutely extraordinary because you've had this whole film up until that mm -hmm. point purely static and then to have this this release it's but that shows a director formal. who understands form and, and what's weird is he that claims the, he doesn't <laughs> but the, what's weird about the um i mean artists don't have a clue about, about mm. their own art but um very often uh but um but what's weird about this film is that the um the uh the for the formal or the, the devices on this occasion yeah. are way more um clumsy and the most obvious one being the, and, and more related to content the most obvious one being uh, the whole film you're told about this tower that doesn't cast any shadows mainly because it's cloudy all the time 
<laughs> although that's not a stated reason it's some magic thing um, and then there's a moment where it appears that the characters themselves are not casting shadows suddenly mm, the um, fantastical kind of creeps in that f- for no it's not it doesn't not transcend in the way that perhaps the ending of uh, Lumanite well that they point it out you know, you know whereas yeah. a Vera Sathical wouldn't have pointed yeah, that out yeah Dumont wouldn't point it out yeah, yeah they would just not have shadows and yeah, maybe yeah. the viewer would notice or maybe they wouldn't yeah. or they, it'd be on the edge of perception I think that's the difference here it's like oh I've done this clever thing yeah. by the way the character is going to tell you this yeah. is happening just in case you miss it because it's you same know, with the ending with the dead yeah um so a yeah. great shame um but but it has an amazing it has an amazing dinner scene and the i, I think george <laughs> source there's there's a karaoke moment when they karaoke their friend in paris uh down the phone and it's the beijing olympics opening uh theme song um and it's it's a great bit of like uh intertextuality between a uh, mass culture and uh, the film i thought it was really fans amazing, of uh, fans that, of opening that sort songs. of uh, <laughs> trivia will be overjoyed i was not it's a trivialist <laughs> film a trivial film for trivialists um, um uh and uh Yes, I was moving on to something else, but I've forgotten. So let's move on. Okay, let's go. Um, Emily Atef appeared in... Um, oh, uh, the only other thing I was going to mm. say was just that it reminded me most of Hong sang Su, whose new film we will see and whose work I've been looking um, at in preparation for. The I film. disagree with that, but maybe we can talk about that after we watch Hong sang Su because it, it didn't feel Hong sang Su ish really at all to me, apart from characters having conversations, but it, it felt it felt like Ho Shen. Shen. Ca- characters having conversations a huge factor. Of most <laughs> films, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but the indulgence, the, 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 <laughs> the, um, the, the need for characters to sort of Stat that, that something that Roma and we can talk. Maybe we need to do another Roma episode where we talk about why exactly it is that Roma does so many things that seem like they would be the exact wrong thing to do, but does film, them correctly. But does them correctly and does yeah. them cinematically. Uh, because yeah, when when Hong Sang Soo does them and when um, this uh, director in this instance Liu Zhang does well, them, well, Hong Sang Soo is not flat. a good filmmaker. So no. end of. Um. Um, so moving on to Emily Atef. Emily Atef is a German director. We have. She's been working in TV and film uh, heavily. Uh, she's, I think, about fifty uh, for the last uh, few decades. Uh, she has acted once in a film called Marseille by Angela Schanlack, who also has a film in the program. Part of this new German mm. cinema wave. There's been many new German cinema waves. This the the is final maybe. putterings of the new yeah, German yeah, cinema. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so yeah. Petzold and Schanlack uh, and Co. Sort of um, and Gries, Griesebach, Griesebach um, yeah. resuscitated. German cinema, which has been legendary at least twice in the in the silent era, and then with Fassbinder and Herzog and Venters, uh, Schlondorf et al. Uh, um, uh, and Hugen. then became legendary again, debatably uh, in the nineties and. Well, it became also. post. It came postmodern with like the uh, w- under the in this kind of uh, I was going to say the, the kind of neoliberal turn in. Um, and the Farrokian turn in, in New German Cinema. We can yeah, get to yeah. that. Um, and when we, when we review Petzold's new film, A Fire, we will talk about this. Um, I, I, shall I just give a quick summary of yeah, yeah, Someday we will tell each other everything. An impossible film name to remember. Um, yeah, um, that's at the it. first mistake um, she's made. The second mistake she's made <laughs> is <a> shit. <laughs> it's going to make a bad film. Um, so uh, it's set, uh, it has two elements to it that it is quite proud of having combined. The first element is the fact that the Berlin Wall has just fallen. Um, Berlin, a city. We are we are coming you coming to you live. You're telling me this now for the first time. <laughs> the Berlin Wall has fallen um, 30 plus years ago in 1990. Uh, of course, a huge moment for people, uh, especially people whose families were split across this. Uh, um, across this line, this geopolitical divide. terrible things for lovers of uh, GDR aesthetics. Exactly, and this uh, this film is a bit is about a family that has a, uh, some, sorry, a family in the east that has uh, uh, some some people on the on the west who are united. But this is not the main story. The main story is a woman in this family in the east who uh, has a boyfriend. She lives with her uh, her boyfriend, not with her family, who Your she's hands. somewhat uh, has a somewhat complicated fraught relationship with her mother, um, and uh, and she's she's uh, in love. What's her name? She's called Maria. She's in love with Yo. She's not in love with Johan. Johan is she's her with young Johan. boyfriend. She's a young boyfriend, first love. You know, you, when you start out, you, know, you date someone your age, and then if she's in love with her, she falls in love with a man called Hanna. Hanna. Henna. 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 Uh, yeah. And you find a you find a farmer. You find a gruff farmer twice your age uh, who will uh, violently rail you um, uh, at the first opportunity which is what happens in this film it is meant to be shall I just talk about what I think this film is hoping it will be yeah it's hoping 
that it would be a devastating juxtaposition of the personal and the political, uh, depicting uh, probably autobiographical uh, feelings and emotions of uh, the director, uh, a, a, a common experience of a woman who ditches her her kind of um, childhood sweetheart for an older father, fi rough. father figure, yeah. a rough-handed uh, father father replacement figure. Um, and uh, and it is uh, it is hoping to be a kind of a new spin on a classic tale. Um, what it ends up as is a very humorless, uh, very. It's also hoping to be like a pastoral romance, perhaps even harking back to the kind of Ger German Romanticism era. Um, in, so to be an erotic film, and to be an erotic well, yeah. film, there are you know there are lots of. It, sex it scenes. depends heavily on its uh, its its cat candid eroticism, I think. However, the one thing that hold I would say I would hazard against the one thing that holds it back from being genuinely erotic, uh, in the way that you know uh, good pornography is, uh, because at times it reminds me of of like films that are pornographic, and then it lacks the humour, or indeed the real like uh, like follow through of, of of a pornographic film. It always sort of cuts to something else. Um, the money shot. Yeah. Something. Well, yeah, but there aren't any. There isn't actually any come. There's just he does these weird thing where they're sort of like slightly kissing for a bit, and then he just like turns her over violently, spits somewhere, and then like just uh, <laughs> does three three pumps, and then kind of like uh, sighs, grunts, so. sighs and grunts, and mm. then she sort of falls in love with him. You know. That's um, how it works. That's love. Yeah, it's maybe. good to show young, young men this is what, what we should work three, towards. Look, you should, it, three, three, <laughs> three pumps is any, fine. Any more than any three more is pumps excessive. is excessive <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and embarrassing. Um, no, I think uh, I think what was annoying about this film was like how laughable it was. Mm. Uh, I booed it. Uh, no one else booed it. Um, What's booing it? But, uh, um, but I, I did boo it because I thought it was... It took up a lot of my time. It was two and a bit hours. Mm. Um, it was. It was. It thought very highly of itself. It had no kind of breaks. It didn't. Even though it thought it was juxtaposing two things, it actually didn't. Um, it didn't weave them together. It didn't weave them together. Right. Nor did it uh, create contrast, chiaroscuro, either visually or. And there was one really beautiful shot with some reflections in a in a mirror and a and, a, and, a, and, a, and some glass. But otherwise, the compositions had no real direction. You'd go from like a. Uh, a, a, sh a shot of her cycling to then a shot of the ground that then goes up to her yeah, cycling. Yeah, it was like an was excess a, of coverage. <laughs> exactly. Basically. They just it took all the coverage. They didn't film it with a sort of actual cinematic energy. They just did loads of TV-ish coverage. Maybe it's because she works on TV. They just mm. and pieced together these these bits of coverage. Oh, and what, what was your experience? Um, I would say, with? yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say um, Lady Chatterley's Lenin. <laughs> and by what I mean, it's it, like, it's just to riff on what you're saying, mm -hmm. it's, it kind of collides or it hadron, attempts to hadron collide Lady Shatley's lover or this, 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 hard you on know, collide. hard on collide, this, this uh, kind of pastoral taboo romance with a political, social, historical structure um, that, you know, I'm, I'm referring here to a, I think the trend has now died away slightly of things like Goodbye Lenin and on TV, Deutschland 89, Deutschland 90. Um, which were films which kind of, I think, looked back at uh, pre-unification Germany into the GDR with the lens of nostalgia, I suppose, in a way, nostalgia for like the simplicities and, uh, of um, the pre-capitalist East Germany. Um, and there's uh, those those Deutschland and Goodbye Lenin are obviously shot in this kind of manic, slightly Amelie-esque uh, caperishness um, and kind of tween nostalgia. Uh, and the film does bits of that. So you'll jolt from rumpy pumpy in the farmhouse to, you know, them, her and Johann shopping in, you know, West, West Germany, as it were, uh, Munich for CD players and, you know, kind of uh, their minds boggling over which coffee to order on this menu because apparently you don't have multiple kinds of coffee in East Germany before 1990. <laughs> um, and I think so, but those things are never really, uh, they never dovetail. They don't interact and play off each other in, in, in interesting ways at all. You could probably have evacuated the entire uh, context of the the Berlin Wall and and left a film there that probably would have been a bit tighter. It mm -hmm. doesn't add anything to it apart from just uh, be real of B Munich. Be roll. Be roll. It's be roll o'clock. <laughs> it's be roll o'clock. Um, so I think it. Yeah, it basically thinks it's being very profound, and by that I mean there are scenes that are obviously attempting to convey gravitas. 
um, but really don't have it. And I think there's uh, moments where I'm thinking Days of Heaven, Malik, Thin Red Line, Malik, The New World, um, where landscape lives and breathes with this languid kind of animal primeval energy. It's a character onto itself with mm -hmm. Malik, and Malik's one of Malik's great strengths, particularly the Thin Red Line, which is obviously the greatest war movie ever shot. Um, and I think greater than Come and See and Iron Shot. I think so. Yeah. yeah, or at least in the on the context of I suppose like Hollywood, the Hollywood response to World War Two or whatever. Yeah. Maybe I should say fair claim. It's um, definitely up there. Yeah. yeah. Like a lot. Um, and the kind of taut majesty and imminence of the, those worlds. So you get these scenes that uh, you see the landscape and these fields in um, this kind of rural uh, farmland in Germany, and they leave you cold. And you see the clouds, and it leaves you cold. Um, and so, the, but they're reaching for profundity, and they seem like uh, they use these visual props to say. Okay, now here's the pathetic fallacy. Mm -hmm. Like the snow with uh, Shadowless Tower, it's, it, it just seems irrelevant to the film. It's The weather doesn't seem to really impact. So it's a lot of it's shot and it's supposed to be in this long, hot summer. Yeah. But it's the least summery summer film. Yeah, when, when you compare yeah, it to yeah. Stray Dog by Kurosawa, which mm. is a film set very swelteringly <laughs> in the heat. Uncomfortable. This, yeah. Everyone seems at perfect temperature. You never see people. It's just like... But is this to do with the way it was shot or is this to do with some kind of like... Because, you know, a pathetic fallacy can... Mm. Like sometimes obvious is good. The right? tempest. I mean, and yeah, yeah. Like sometimes a <laughs> pathetic fallacy is um is 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 blows you away. And mm. uh, this is how I felt generally about the whole film. I felt two sort of uh, two sort of general observations. I thought um, one of them was that like it makes me think that a love triangle coming of age story is not worth doing because it's been done so many times before. I don't actually think that no. because when I see Roma or when I see Mia Hansen Love, when I see good directors handle this material, I think, wow, what a timeless. Uh, thing that's been or a timeless uh, we never, that has been given new yeah, detail and context and will always be compelling because it you know speaks to human and actually oh we only really only have like a ha small handful of stories that we keep telling and blah 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 you know um, but in the hands of Atif it feels totally banal it feels totally limited um, and the other thing I would say is with regards to pacing and shots um, you know I did I did walk out of the cinema it, there's something that may be particular about seeing this at a festival knowing that a lot of these films people won't even get distribution mm. they're sort of playing the market right now um people are seeing them for the first time uh you know <laughs> this isn't the trump <laughs> thing you're telling me no. you're showing like, me wow you're showing me, a terrible director <laughs> you're showing me emily atta for the first time um, um but uh you know this this great um uh, quote when ruth Bader Ginsburg died um but uh, yeah, so uh, at if, um, yeah, it's, it it makes me think because obviously most people don't watch art house films. Most people, That's you know, if if you talk to like a, a normie, uh, you know, about the latest Mia Hansen Love, and film, you're not a normie, are you, listener? No, people who listen yeah. to MoveTube generally are. Uh, Except you, you are, know, you are, are talking kind to. of uh, yeah. <laughs> Listeners to movie are generally art house you know film connoisseurs and admirers. Uh, they have great taste, um, and uh, they're all extremely hot. Yeah, no, of course, at least a seven. Of course, of course. Uh, of course the board. Uh, I haven't met any of them, but you no, know, no, no, guess. No, no doubt. Um, but uh, but yes, the uh, so. <laughs> art house film. Art house film is you know not the most popular form of film. And that is a shame because, mm. you know, most of my favorite film, partly it's because people won't read subtitles, that's annoying. Um, mm. But partly it's because they're maybe slower. There's this whole idea that nothing happens or nothing important happens. Um, and there's an idea that they're indulgent, that they're pretentious. Now, I am usually extremely resistant to pretension as an accusation. I'm usually extremely resistant. It's a philistine. It's a philistine critique. But. However, every so often I am forced to watch a film which completely... Um, confirms uh, this 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 accusation, um, and it, it makes me very sad because it's like people won't watch Jeanne Dillman, which is like a totally transcendent art house in quotes film, because they might have seen some bullshit by Emily Atif that is just needlessly slow and poorly constructed. It's kind of picture house fare um, for UK market. You know that means it's, you know, so it will perform well. At they UK. may well distribute it, yeah. They probably will. And I think, Ball yeah, for movie. me, I think there's this... <laughs> Actually, a Match Factory um, commissioned it. Oh, so it'll be movie. It, so it will be yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, it'll land in the living rooms of uh, the United Kingdom and elsewhere. But I think there's this... So no one will watch. Belief... <laughs> 
I mean, I think it will do very well in Germany because it does, it lays claim to this kind of state of the nation film uh, about unification. Uh, I think the and Germans the in the audience Nazis really enjoyed, uh, probably a lot more than we did. Um, it's obviously, uh, I, I think it, it kind of limps around yeah it, that that element feels extraneous it feels like it was kind of uh this film could have been set today for example um mm -hmm. i said this earlier but i think to talk more again back to form and i was talking about summer you know and you don't think about films like summer with monica and um, things like this where the things like sweat beads of sweat mm -hmm. um, people you feel it rising off the screen when it's good moving their clothing around there's there's physical um gestures that you can show but people it, the, the heat is not present so it's like what it does look like is like the grade has been bumped to give mm. everything this glow but it's not present and in the, the sound design texture. was crushed as well so you, you get this these super close mics so when pe when they're having sex particularly you're hearing every fingertip running across uh the skin which done punctuated in the right way can work really well but when it's consistent in these scenes it's suddenly like okay let's boost the mic it's just deafening it's yeah, it's and it's, it's a gross it's a gross misunderstanding of what the power is and you get it a lot in short films you ever go to a short film screening um there will always be a film where someone eats food loudly yeah and 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 uh, and it's very irritating because um you you normally can't hear people eat food that loudly. I'm not. It's not that. I, not that I, I would advocate naturalism in every case. But there is. There's a great Hitchcock quote. Again, I'm not like a huge Hitch Hitchcock stan, but that you know he he did build. Mm. He, he created the building blocks uh, for cinema in various important ways in terms of tension and suspense. Um, and he said, you know, the size of a object on screen cor should correspond to its, its importance in the, in the plot. Yeah. Um, now there are obviously like transcendent filmmakers like Tarkovsky who who go for a more poetic approach. To this dictum, I think the dictum still stands, but it's a more, mm. it's not in terms of, it's not, it's not using that in terms of. It's a rubric. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, in the case of Emily Atif, there is neither the poetry of like, say, a mirror where the sound of glass breaking becomes kind of. It dynamic. shatters through yeah. the film. Yeah. While other things are pulled back, the kind of Bressonian idea that sound and visual, uh, the sound and the visual element, elements should be telling completely different stories. They should mm. be informing each other kind of from without. Um, but n nor does it do the Hitchcockian thing of, making loud and big things that are important and s and sifting away all the rest it makes loud and big loads of things which aren't important uh, mm. and this feels like very very um uh, sophomore very junior very kind of um well it, it felt like tv it felt like a sort of uh heightened tv heightened tv from TV. someone who thinks they ought to just turn all the knobs up for cinema yeah you know and i think um there's this thing about intimacy as well and i think you talked about we, we discussed coverage earlier this kind of zany coverage mm. um uh, this, 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 yeah, this is almost, almost... No shot lasts long enough. No shot lasts long enough, really, but there's also this sense of um, uh, the camera always having to be confounded with the eye or very close over the shoulder or hovering very near to people. There's mm. very few medium shots in this film. Yeah. In a landscape that's begging for them, it's yeah. really begging for a stab more establishment and not through these lazy Malikian uh, Days of Heaven intertitles but through just a bit more width. And I think the film is constantly up in everyone's fucking space. Mm. Um, Again, it's an amazing misconception of, of intimacy. Of how it is. The idea made, that yeah. you should, the way to, you know, we had this problem with Close that we reviewed um, last year in, 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 in the New Horizons Festival, yeah. Lucas Don's Close, which is now coming out in the UK. Um, the idea that you, that in order to show intimacy, you should have loads of close shots mm. is like, is a misconception. It's a very, well, also it's think a very about, nice. you know, you think about Fellini and how Fellini explores uh, sorry, Antonioni explores ideas of alienation and intimacy through a distant camera. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's the, the Angelopoulos too. Pun Angelopoulos too. Angelopoulos <laughs> as well. You know, and there's 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 just because the camera is is a light mobile thing that can be mm. handheld around, it doesn't it just it doesn't necessarily deserve deserve or need that at all times. And I think yeah. the camera was too hungry for. Um, it was almost it was too lustful in a way for these bodies that weren't really uh, lusting or really weren't really evoking much yeah. eroticism. And I think and there's there's a there's a there's a sense in which, um, yeah, there's a sense in which the film just felt uh, just profoundly middle brow in a lot of ways, and also like you said, very pretentious. I think um, s seeking. Uh, seeking to be applauded for profundities that weren't really owned or weren't Absolutely. really there. Um, 
And a bit of formal restraint would have let the audience in, you know, and that's what's important. Yeah, there th- was one device I really liked, which was when she, her, her shitty boy, childhood boyfriend is a photographer mm. and he wants to go and photograph the villagers in this kind of like John Berger sort of authenticity way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he photographs Henna not realizing that his girlfriend is sleeping with Henna. And he takes a photo and he takes it while she's looking out the window behind some uh, curtain. Mm. Some, uh, some gauze uh, he takes a photo and she's like terribly worried that this will give away the affair and then of course when he's developing it he sort of uh, in the in the red in the red uh, in the red room, in the dark, dark room, room yeah. um he finds the photo and says oh look henna's was with, henna was with a woman uh that's why he didn't want me to come inside and she's like oh phew, you know. yeah this is the suspense that was really i think that but that, in was a way that was the only bit of suspense that then it became reality because you know, you know throughout <laughs> the film she's trying to hide this affair um, from the family she's staying with, Johan's family. And I think, again, it, it plays up that this is a, a very, a game of cat and mouse. Um, but there's no real tension in that either. It's, it doesn't seem no. very difficult for her to hide this affair. Um, there's yeah, a bit where the, the, gra- the granddad sort of re- realizes maybe a bit, but it's kind of picked up and dropped. That and he, it's almost like she thinks that there's more intelligence and more subtlety in not pursuing these these like clearly more interesting elements or interesting mm. ways to convey the emotion we have to stay with the emotion itself it's a very therapy culture almost isn't it? yeah because i think there's, there's there's a scene where yeah repeated going returns to munich uh where um uh the the beast from the east uh henna <laughs> decides to go to munich and he goes and he's just a simple country boy and he's befuddled by all the you know uh, all the capitalist splendor of fucking Munich. Yeah, he's he goes to a cafe character. and they say, would you like a big beer or a small beer? And he's like, I don't know, a beer. And then offers him like lager and another beer. And he's like, oh, oh, oh this is too much. This is too much. Oh, and yeah, like he's like, freaks how out. stupid is Come this guy? <laughs> and I think it's sp- again, I think there she's trying to play for this em- empathetic kind of... This is why people voted for Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think she's trying to this play for this... attitude um, towards the rural people. To the rural working classes. And she's trying to play towards this idea that... Um, uh, Henna is of the East and is confounded by the machineries of capitalism, but it, it's n- it's not that. He, it's a very simple order. And above. so you just come and think this guy's a retard, <laughs> simpleton. I think there's also um, so my my final my final point with this film, and I think you know we talked about Lu Shang earlier, and one of the things I love about Lu Shang is his, his intertextuality and his in, his in, in, inter, interjection with texts, extraneous and often jarring texts into mm-hmm. his films, particularly his early films. And here we have um, the actual and title of the film is from um, Brothers Karamazov. Um, and uh, throughout the novel, at various points, we see um, Mary, Marianne, whatever her name is, reading Brothers Karamazov. Really for any reason. It's, it's, it's introduced as this kind of uh, Chekhov's gun. It's a Chekhov's gun almost for the, the title of the film. She's reading Brothers Karamazov. Um, a book which bears literally no relation to it's a, a, a theological and existential text about so if it's like uh, vaguely about love maybe yeah, or something but fa- fatherly love love mm. for the father you know it's um and brotherly fraternity but there's it's a bit about where the, 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 the boyfriend says oh it's about love is it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i think there's so but lazy. then it, at the end we get at the very end of the film we get marianne's voiceover and there's been no voiceover until this point where she reminds she reminds us that she's looking back on this and then she says you know as uh, you know, as, as Dostoevsky writes in Karamazov, blah 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 blah, uh, and it's like that felt entirely unnecessary. Mm-hmm. This piece of intertextuality um, introduced out of like this out of the blue, um, and I didn't understand that. I didn't understand um, why this Karamazov reference was there for no other reason again than to congratulate itself for saying actually this is a clever film, this is a literary film. Yeah, this is Bell Letters, you know. Uh, Very unfortunate. I think now we might move on to Blackberry. So older listeners of the podcast uh, might remember that before we all used iPhones, there was a type of phone with a uh, with buttons on it, a key, a QWERTY keypad, much like you might get on a laptop, um, manufactured by a company called Blackberry, and they had very significant market share. They were part of the arrival of smartphones into mm. our lives. Um, they so could like send, 2003, 2004. Yeah, yeah, coming up to 2007 when the iPhone was launched. Um, but they maintained market um, uh, supremacy for a few years until, you know, beyond that. It all came um, tumbling down. But it all came tumbling down. This is uh, not a spoiler. Anyone who's been aware, very, even vaguely aware of technology um in the last 10 years or mm. so, we'll know that BlackBerry is no longer a factor. 
Um, the company still exists, but it's owned by different people and it, produce, hollowed out. it produces uh, software. Um, so this is a, Cana- a film made by Canadian TV, made by Matt Johnson, who also plays uh, the character of... Shit, what's his name? The, the, guy, the guy with the headband who's kind of irritating. Uh, Doug. Doug, Doug yeah. who's a big movie fan. And, and we went to a press he's conference and we saw him talk and, and he's very much like his character. In fact, everyone, everyone seems to be very like their character. Apart from Glenn Houghton, he claims he's, not, he's a man of peace. And a, a, he's in a touch with his feminine side, side. which I, I was not totally convinced of. He seems to have more of a Tom Cruise vibe than anything else. Yeah. Um, but he's there with a ball. He's apparently in a show called uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I, I love how you, you, you have no <laughs> awareness of Glenn Houghton. Like, not only is it's Always Sunny funny in Philadelphia extraordinary but it's also uh, this is talking to someone who's you know he's not a, a routine as you know a routine kind of sitcom um, but also one of the great unhinged actors well hopefully mm. listeners um, to Houghton. this show will know uh, who Glenn Houghton is um, I don't but uh, now I do <laughs> um, he plays uh, Jim Ball Silly Ball Silly uh, Silly Balls um, who uh helped to in the very early days of blackberry helped to finance and to and invigorate, and to, invigorate. And to turn it from this kind of dorm room op into a a kind of lean mean um silicon machine silicon valley machine yeah exactly although they never went to silicon valley they stayed in canada uh, canada waterloo in canada. Waterloo, canada ontario canada which very much the geopolitical side man of america <laughs> <laughs> canada i don't want to demean the side canadian. piece of and the I, we, I think you know canadian masculinity has always been fraught because a canadian man no matter how strong and masculine he is, can never really be American. Sorry, sorry, Michael <laughs> Michael Stowe's corpse is still warmish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why you're saying this. The, just, the Canadian <laughs> filmmaker, there are none of this. I just thought so. that, that's a funny and obviously ridiculous thought that crosses my mind every so often when I when I encounter Canadians that that they might experience this form of um, emasculation, emasculation and inferiority, which definitely runs Certainly. through the film. It is the first, um, you know. Films like The Social Network and Steve Jobs um, uh, and the other film about Steve Jobs um, definitely have their highs and lows, but they, in the context in which they were made, um, serve as... Uh, well, the, the difference with those films... as you said. Yeah, but I think um, the difference with those films is they are not tech stories. They're stories of human beings. Human beings think, and yeah, yeah. of psy- psycho... Uh, psychosocial drama more than True. more than whereas this is a first this is primarily a a yes i did call it hagiography but i think it's also a really it's a a book this is one of those kind of pop um sociology textbooks that seems to do very well in waterston oh, about yeah. the rise Losing of fall. the signal it's called yeah the story of blackberry yeah <laughs> yeah um out of touch because um, yeah, yeah, yeah. i didn't get a touch screen properly um and so I think there's a hagiographic element with all of these types of films. Um, this one feels like a smorgasbord uh, of, and they, they explicitly made a, uh, their admiration for the office clear uh, in the press conference. Um, I think that's a fair reference. It does it does feel officey, um, uh, uh, British and then later American, not Canadian series. Um, and I think there is a there are references or, or similarities, obviously, to things like The Big Short, mm-hmm. uh, to the Social Network. Um, it borrows from the language of this t- particular kind of type of hagiography about uh, tech, which often are seen are um, broadly conceived as being uh, critiques of um, capital in a kind of Pickettian um, sense. Uh, but I think can you just briefly describe the w- way in which Piketty critiques capital as opposed to a Marxist. I think in this, in a, a sort of liberal, like the liberal agenda underpinning In that it Piketty. centers around human behavior needing to change rather than a structure. Yeah, I think so. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm misreading Piketty, but I mean, I'm more, more, I more mean like the, the kind of structure of feeling around Piketty because okay. his, his, you know, his, his capital was just, was su- profoundly influential amongst kind of liberal liberal minded um uh, kind of soft left um mm-hmm. uh figures but not marxists i think who tend uh, to who think? have a materialist analysis right, of, right, right, of right, right. these things and right. it's so it's 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 kind of seen as a sop reformist not reformist, revolutionary yeah radical. so it's it's lutheran rather than calvinist i think mm-hmm. it's probably the way to put it um and i think this film you know they they it's still a kind of uh 
it's in like a hagiography like, you know you're, it's it's a life of a saint it's auditory it's laudatory we're celebrating the amazing technical upheavals they're able to make mm-hmm. the midnight oil that they burn um the te- like kind of the ingenuity mm-hmm that's uh, used to turn this, you know, sort of uh, to kind of dominate the market and then to, to suffer a catastrophic fall. Um, so I don't think the film is really that interested in this film in particular, is that interested in interrogating um, the kind of capital, the, the materialist context of uh, the, the smartphone market, maybe. Um, it kind of alludes to it, but it's more, no, in a way it's in more of a, just a kind of snappy, uh, kind of comedy of manners about a tech company rising yeah. and falling. It's not really that invested in the, in 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 the actual kind of social and economic context underpinning it and giving rise to it, which is kind of what it, I think it thinks it's doing. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't necessarily want a film about um, uh, if one is if one is even to make a film about the rise and fall of BlackBerry. Um, I'm not sure one would necessarily want it to be a sort of film about the structures. Maybe it could be. I'd, I'd be interested. To I just mean that. a bit more, a bit more critical idea. of you know, it's it it's yeah. Maybe it's unaware of the. I don't know. It's it's hard to formulate why. It's just it's it's not. It hasn't got like the critical chops of something like the Big Short, for example. Right, right, it right, it right, feels. Right. It, I think it thinks it's being the Big Short, but it's not. Because the, the Big, Big Short, Short is like a is like a very expensive like. Um, now this or Navarra sort of explainer basically it's like kind of it, yeah it's much more didactic I think what's interesting about say so let's compare Steve Jobs at the social network and this film they all have this kind of like autistic protagonist um, uh, in, in you know, it's the type this, Mike Lazaridis it's, in Mike, the, it's yeah. Mike, Mike Lazaridis um, who was the sort of, uh, uh, kind of tech brains behind uh, Blackberry while Balsillie was kind of the entrepreneurial the money e- economic brains behind it. So they, they needed each other, these two people. Um, uh, obviously, Steve Jobs was sort of both of those things for Apple and uh, Mark Zuckerberg as well to an extent. Um, and they are... So in, in, in Steve Jobs and, and uh, the social network, the tech entrepreneur is presented as, um, in their personal life, deeply flawed and disconnected mm. and alienated and cruel. Um, but f- more or less infallible and mercurial and genius in their professional life. And I think the difference with BlackBerry, and maybe this is a superficial difference, but I suppose the other difference is that BlackBerry f- shows an, a downward arc at the end, whereas these, mm. when, I mean, Facebook may be in decline now, but when Social Network was made, it, it was, was very much up. about Facebook being the most successful uh, website. Yeah. But um, yeah, like they, 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 even though they do have this scene at the beginning where Mike Lazarus is like, with his mad perfectionism takes apart like a little intercom machine and like solves the solves the glitch in it even though no one really cares um but it just shows how important he how perfectionist he is and this sort of foreshadows his success you're sort of watching this thinking okay because this is happening because this is his character and it's his character that will it's his this particular quality in his character that will mean that he wins but of course it is also this character this kind of unawareness this autism this like unawareness of of like this refusal to acknowledge other aspects like the SEC calling up all the time or like the kind of interpersonal dynamics, the the, uh, the fraud that's happening um, or like, you know, the way in which some of his colleagues are just like not up to the job. Um, you know, it's that that's his downfall. And so it's a genuinely kind of balanced portrayal of someone having professional strengths and weaknesses. Whereas I think those, the films about um, yeah. the more hagiographic films, I think of, of the social network and, and of Steve Jobs, are are more just working with this professional personal di- um yeah i think there's also a, a kind uh, of um countervailing um or the narrative arc is how he will eventually compromise his his perfectionism and his fundamental beliefs um uh in the interests of i i guess not so much ex- succeeding but escaping ruin so mm-hmm. at the end, he finally agrees to have the phones manufactured in China. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the few times, I suppose, where it kind of does rear its head about the kind of wider political and economic context of mm. um, smartphone manufacturing. Whatever. Um, and in, in doing that, it kind of breaks his own rule about um, uh, uh, kind of manufacturing quality. Mm. So the phones that are then produced are rubbish. They don't work. Mm. It was an order that was, you know, sort of a catastrophic failure. It was their last gasp of blackberry um and it all came from him having to compromise his, his yeah. fundamental values so there's a kind of um the rise and fall is also the rise and fall of a man in a way but we're not in the way that say jesse eisenberg um plays mark zuckerberg uh with this frenetic uh machiavellian 
uh, I, I guess, jaggedness in, mm-hmm. uh, in the social network. And we see, really, that is about, that film is about him. And it's about, you know, mm-hmm. like you said, this kind of mercurial character. Um, this film is a bit more archetypal in how it treats its characters. You know, it says you have the money man, you have the kind of goofy uh, dude bro nerd, you have the tech um, kind of obsessive uh, autist. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, at no point does it kind of cast a light into their personal lives. It's purely at the office um, and it get, rushes through a series of kind of time trials, basically. That's how the film is structured. A series of like, we have to do the X in order to solve problem Y and they mm-hmm. solve that problem. And then there's another bigger hurdle to jump and another hurdle to jump. So it's a series of kind of increasingly pressurized uh, challenges, basically. Sort of like the, the, the kind of crystal maze of uh, filmmaking. Um, yeah, so I don't. I don't think it's it. It thinks it's doing great things. I think it's it's very, it's what we'd politely call a romp. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's and a bit of a joy, a joy. I mean, it's it's fun enough. I mean, yeah, but I think in in the grand tradition of like all the the, the shadow the of Sorkin new, looms large. Yeah, it does in a way. Um, Aaron Sorkin, who wrote Steve Jobs. And yeah, yeah. I, I think, but I mean, more so. I think just the shadow of like we are now entering a phase where these films are going to start uh, these 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 kind of autopsies are going to become probably more more prominent um you the know the future of cinema is films about dementia and films about, about tech entrepreneurs tech opinions, or autistic tech you know you'll have your reddit film and you'll have your twitter film and you'll have you know your quora film and so yeah, on this so. was your argument that we we will never we, be we, able we to must now evaluate aspire <laughs> all structural film or we just be we'll just be all not structural. Well, the longest like, it would be like that this is be the cinema is now like yeah tech hagography so yeah absolutely i mean so the, the longest the longest film ever made mm-hmm. um is actually a, in theory a structural film it's a conceptual piece of mm-hmm. conceptual art which is uh about um a uh, about um uh, chain of production of a I can't actually remember what the object is it's something like a pair of sunglasses or something so it, it it's the film is actually about three and a half weeks long and mm-hmm. follows uh, the whole process from uh, manufacture to packaging distribution to a warehouse sale point of sale mm-hmm. um, and obviously I don't, I don't know if anyone's seen the whole film I think it was shown in a kind of like a installation context that was running in um, wherever for a few weeks um, so that that is obviously the the Ur example of mm-hmm. these kind of procedural tech films mm-hmm. in a way and it's like I think maybe in some senses it might be the most interesting one if not the probably it's probably least engaging um, so I think yeah the, the fundamentally these films yeah I don't know yeah the, the, this is the the new hagiography of the the platforms that we have so instead of having the lives of the saints we have the lives of the entrepreneurs the bet like you said Sorkin's kind of like done it best and hasn't really been bettered yeah and um, that, that was what sort of um made me less enthusiastic about seeing this although it was quite enjoyable mm. um and it was quite televisual unfortunately um you know formally it's basically just like a mock mockumentary shaky camera like nothing particularly extraordinary there yeah the directors w- made quite a point of saying that they didn't like to do masters they like to just capture the energy by like being kind of having close shots shaky close shots all the time which i don't think there's anything particularly novel about that there's lots of things that look like that now mostly tv shows um so 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 can i say so just i wanted to check that i was correct about this so the, the longest film ever made is called logistics <laughs> <laughs> from 2012 it's swedish <coughs> it's fifty one thousand four hundred twenty minutes long so 35 days and 17 hours that is the longest film Ever made and it was it was screened in the House of Culture in Stockholm. So yeah, that is the that is the um, Sweden. They've got the money to do this sort of thing. Uh, to make that three weeks. Um, Let's see. Can we? Can, I think we've basically squeezed the blackberry for all its juice. Um, Bitter juice. Can we very um, briefly talk about a film uh, that we walked out of the first walk out of Berlinale? Uh, Survival of Kindness by Rolf De Beer, an Australian oh. film, <laughs> um, which opens yeah, with well, it opens with a. a this is one point I wanted to make actually about sand design. We made it earlier with re- reference to the Emily Atta film. Um, if a film st- has like ostentatious sound design, this, there's the sound of someone cutting a cake and you have this squelching sound. You, you know pretty much that it's going to be kind of ideological in some way or dogmatic or heavy handed. Um, unless that cake itself holds huge like, uh, you know. Ah, so counterpoint, uh, or not counterpoint, but example of that would be L'Argent. Um, the bowl of hot chocolate that's spilled um, when it's being carried into the house. That's a great example of this eruptive sound design, mm. of this sloshing of this 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 cup of hot chocolate. True, and I guess that would fit better into my 
my sort of second acceptable case of, mm. of uh, ostentatious sound design, which is, of course, the poetic. Yeah, the poetic, of, uh, the meditative, time, the meditative the transcendent. Time, yeah. um, so, so I don't sound like I'm sort of uh, making up my theory as I go along. Um, but yeah, survival of kindness is, by all accounts, including ours, Treble. a fucking awful ideological film, um, clearly made by a guilty white uh, Australian. Uh, it stars a... I'm heaps guilty. Uh, he's heaps guilty about all the indigenous bad stuff. Um, it, it's, a, it's a black woman who's called in the cast black woman. She's stuck in a cage. She, uh, for days, so they are day and night, day and night. She's stuck in this cage. She manages to get out of the cage. Um, there's like this brief moment. It's I, basically, I got very upset when I invoked Bresson, but there's this brief, like, slightly homage to Bresson. Get his name um, out of your mouth. I know. It, it doesn't, it's Please. not to its credit at all that I, that I invoke him, but it's yeah. just, you know, it's in the water. Um, this brief moment where she kind of escapes, um, and then she just starts weeping. People it's, doing stuff isn't Bresson. No, but often when people... I mean, I think it also is referring not to EO because that's come mm. out very recently, but maybe to Ohasad Balthazar, this kind of like passive victim of society. Oh, mm. cr- much a very... May I just say, as a fan of Ohasad Balthazar, this is obviously a massive... Um, uh, crude, a crude. Um, uh, well, no, no, it's, of, it's, of what, it's, uh, what that film achieves. It's worth to unpack. So, obviously, my, my the distaste with something a film like um, uh, the survival of the kindness, survival of kindness uh, is that uh, it's it's an allegorical film, and, and film is already an abstraction from reality, um, and it adds another abstraction on top of the abstraction and I think that it has a diluting effect when it thinks it's actually clarifying and I think it doesn't trust the power of cinema no it doesn't I mean there are <laughs> there are great allegorical films they can be done you take a thing like, film like Salo but Salo is a fully procedural film mm-hmm. you know it's, it's allegory is yeah you've got the the, the it's a film the with ta- humour as well humour uh, um this does and also things. great and just amazing <laughs> production design and a very beautiful, very transcendent mm-hmm. film. And a, a film which reeks of unpleasantness, whereas this mm-hmm. film is supposed to be doing that. But I think it's also, I, I hated the banksification of it. Mm-hmm. The, the kind of the fact that the white oppressors in the film are all wearing gas masks for some reason. So you, their, their voices are muted. There's some little muted. referred to dystopia well, in the distance. Like there's like the kind of clangers um, bumbling around. And the way in which we don't hear their voices presumably meant to conjure the experience that slaves uh, disorientation felt. Uh, of hearing of being voices the other. they didn't understand uh, taking them away moving yeah around. but I think I think there's uh, it, it really doesn't work it was it was a stupid allegorical film that again reaches for profundity um, but was just such an embarrassing kind of uh, ideological um, uh, kind of flare shot up in the midst of uh, Potsdam and Platz and I think the you know I'm sure I'm sure it, it, it just felt you know it, it felt um like a student project, really, yeah. you know. I don't think it will do ways. well, um, but no. I think it's worth emphasising that it's a, a stupid and hollow film and it's a, a grave Deeply embarrassment hollow. that anyone is taking it seriously. But EO was an interesting film about, which has a similar kind of this, uh, a, a sort of uh, a hero's journey, like mm-hmm. a, a rakes or pilgrim's progress, um, featuring a, a uh, you know, a, a subject, you know, a, a subject who is subject to the violences, the arbitrary mm-hmm. violences, uh, whims of, of humanity. But I think, again, that film... Uh, EO by Skolomowski is not perfect but it's Mm. it's certainly a very interesting a very good film and does its allegory is not as direct because it's not telling you that it's it's allegorical yeah it's not telling you that it's allegory I don't love EO but um, but I uh, I, it's certainly distinguished from this yeah this pap Um, Um, but we did we did we did uh, we did walk out on the other side so um, speaking of walkouts we are now walking out of the the Airbnb podcasting studio to see more films. Um, we will tonight be watching uh, Disco Boy by, by Abruzzese. Giacomo. G- 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 is it Giacomo? Giacomo Abruzzese. Yeah. Um, I, I also, on my own, saw Beasts of the Jungle and she came to me. I saw that with George. We'll be having him on in the next pod mm. um, to discuss that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's yeah, some other bits of so floating in the water. I mean, I, I saw um, Ming, Ming On, on yeah. so A Mad Fate uh, by Soi Cheung, mm-hmm. um, which, uh, you know, I very briefly glossed, but I think is 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 it reminded me most of kind of Sion Sono, this kind of maximal expressionist postmodern um, genre bender, I suppose, mm-hmm. if I put a series of just words together, in a kind of string. Um, yeah, but kind of um, something. It, yeah, kind of something. I think it, you know, it was uh, it had a, it had a real knack for. He has a real knack for, um, for I think, uh, squeezing 
the sublime or at least the, the spectacular out of genre. Mm-hmm. I think um, it is very adept, like Sion Sono, of taking it to very strange places. And it's 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 it really overstayed its welcome. It's a very long, very long, almost two and a half hours long uh, film that I saw last night in a kind of delirious, uh, sleep deprived state. Um, but it does. Yeah, it might bear it might bear watching. I think it was like it's a Hong Kong film, which is basically doing. Sion Sono is also doing a bit of South Korean maximalism. Mm. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's certainly more interesting than Decision to Leave, which some people might draw that comparison with. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for joining us thank uh, you for, uh, for our report, our dispatch from Berlin. Uh, we will be uh, back talking the about the rest of the films um, very sh- very soon. We've got loads. We've got loads. We've got Philip Garrell. We've got Hong San Su. They're both those films probably gonna be bad. We've got a, we've got a fresh James Benning as well, which oh, is yeah. a bit of a. And we've got uh, Luke Fowler's film about yeah. Margaret Tang. That could be good. I did like his film about Ardi Lang. So there's um, a lot. There's a lot. And in the we've mix. got um, uh, my friend Graham's film Home Invasion, which I'm quite excited about. Where is the friends Graham? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, what else have we got? Oh yeah, conflict Sh- of interest. Shanna Lack. We've got Shanna Lack's new film. So she made oh, Marseille. Uh, Did you mention that already? We've got Pepe Pestel's new film as well. Oh we've yeah, Pepe Pestel's got, yeah, got yeah. new. new There's quite Pestel's, a lot to go. Um, um, but yes. Uh, oh, and it, it's Margareta von Trotter's film about Ingeborg Bachmann starring Vicky Kripes, and Passages Kripes-y. as well um, by uh, 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 what's the uh, Iris Sachs, um, so and you possibly know. Infinity Pool by the Cronenberg so Spawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's that will be enough to be getting on with. Um, um, our, our, our cup runneth over, over and out. Bye. Bye.